we do walk by faith. Amen. Thank you for participating with us in, in worship of God. Are you comfortable? Okay. All right. Kids, are you about ready to go? Miss Tiffany's back there. You're going to have a great time together. That's just the little kids now, okay? Some of you gray-haired kids can't go. Well, we've been uh, reading through the Bible this year. Not anything new for us, right? Uh, some of you that have been with us for a long time, this is either eight or nine years, and I'm not sure exactly. Need to go back and look at that a little bit more. That we've uh, tried to read through the Bible. Most of you have accompanied that, and uh, so you're, this is not your first rodeo getting through it. Uh, but it's a great accomplishment. And if you're like I am, every time I read through there, I find things that I didn't know were there. And I, I, I think, I didn't read that last year. But evidently I did, it just didn't register. So we're discovering things. It's exciting to see that God's Word is living and that it just opens and reveals more and more. And the more in tune we get with God, and the more time that we spend in His Word, the more revelation that comes to light. And I believe that at the longer that we live, and the, the more we see world events, and we get kind of tuned in a little bit to see kind of what is happening in the world, and you begin to place that back with history and see what has happened and how things happen over and over and how history repeats itself and how God works cyclically and just in a circle. It's amazing that you can kind of see what's coming. Um, this morning early, the moon was right, right around, right up in there. It's, uh, I thought, that's a perfect half moon. So when I got here this morning, I... I looked on my the app that I have on my phone it's 58 percent I missed it but it's it's just about right in half so we're halfway through this month uh, at the end of this month we're going to start what will be the the month of Aviv on the on the Hebrew calendar the first month of the year and then on the 14th day of that month we will have Passover so our festival season is right here rejoicing and celebrating and realizing that God's at work. There's going to be some very exciting things, I believe, this year and next year and maybe the following year. The fact that there's going to be blood moons next month, uh, the beginning of four blood moons that fall on Passover and Tabernacles and then Passover and Tabernacles of next year. Exciting times. I would suggest to us that it's time to really dig into God's Word and look at prophecy and look at what's happening and see what God wants to do in our individual lives. Well, that's, that's an exciting time. This week we've read Numbers and uh, we're just about through with it. In the next day or so you'll have completed the book of Numbers and you move over to Deuteronomy. Some of you will be rejoicing that Numbers is behind you again. Uh, and. Uh, it is kind of tough reading, especially those that are just, uh, just line after line after line of people's names. And then it says, and the tribe of Reuben has 52,000, whatever, you know. And then you go to another tribe. And you just, those, and yet there's a, a lot of significance there in what we've been doing. I want to spend a little bit more time, and actually for those of you that were here yesterday, a kind of a, a continuation of where we were. We looked at numbers and we looked at several different things there. And I want to bring a little bit different perspective today uh, about what numbers has for us. And I want you to kind of bear with me because some of the things will be uh, alignment with what we did yesterday. We looked at the book of numbers and, uh, and we see that, that uh, it's... Uh, the way things stack up there is kind of unusual, you know. And uh, it's a numbering process. Numbers, uh, 
The book of Numbers actually takes place in three different places at Mount Sinai. It begins and it, it's uh, uh, while they're camped there and then while they travel and then while they camp again and while they travel again and then as they go into the promised land, it's, a, it's an interesting book. They're at Mount Sinai. They've just left Egypt. Uh, they've um, been in slavery and they don't know how to govern themselves. So God is taking a, a period of time to give them the law, to share the covenant with them, to get them organized and teach them how to, uh, how to camp and how to work within groups, uh, get them divided up, work out all the, the nitty-gritty things that they need to do before they get to Canaan. Now, uh, as we mentioned yesterday, this, uh, this journey going to Canaan was not just a vacation and traveling there and they're going to be arms wide open when you get there to receive you. It's going to be a battle all the way there. Uh, you're going to have, have to cross people's territories, and that's a huge job. We looked yesterday at the two different senses that were taken. Uh, the first one, there were 605,550, I believe, um, military men that were men 20 years old and older that were able to fight. So you got 603,000 of them. Uh, that makes a pretty big crowd. Now, they're living with their families. They're divided up into all the camps. Remember that, that there were no military men from the tribe of Levi. So if you take the, the, uh, the 12 tribes and you multiply that out and you try to come up with some numbers, we're talking upwards of 2 million people in the wilderness. Uh, they're camped there. They're ready to, to move forward. And they're getting their military mind together. Now these are slaves. Physically they're very fit and they're ready, but they're not military people. Uh, I personally believe that they gained their military weapons after the crossing of the Red Sea when Pharaoh and his army were drowned in the sea and then their military things, the spears and all that, floated up on the, on the shore. And they were able to get those and, and take them with them. Uh, and then maybe construct or build bows and arrows and those sort of things, they understand that they're going to have battle ahead of them. Now, God has promised them the promised land, and it's, a, it's a, a occupied. And after we get over there at the end of, of the book of Numbers, we realize that they go in and look at the land, and they say, man, this is really great. But... There are giants there, and I don't think we're big enough to, to, to defeat them. And that's the whole story, kind of a nut, nutshell here of, uh, uh, of Numbers. When they first get to Mount Sinai, uh, they start in this, uh, this cycle that we see back and forth in the Scriptures where they're excited about what God's doing for them. Can you imagine having been born in slavery, grown up and worked in slavery, and then all of a sudden you're set free? And, and the bonds are released, and you are able to leave, and you're going, and you've been promised a great place to live and everything. The excitement and the praise of the Lord. But then just a few days out, they begin to grumble. And so they start this cycle of complaining and, and doubting and not believing in God. And then something happens and they're brought back. Well, at Mount Sinai, uh, at the very, very beginning, God kills about 15,000 of them. And uh, it's, uh, it just happens over and over there to get their attention and draw them back. So we see this balance of God's love and yet his justice and how his justice always brings you back to his love. And it, and it works together, the discipline that's there and, and the justice of God. Uh, this shows you uh, an outline of how uh, they were camped. Uh, it's a, an artist drawing, and it's, uh, I think, very interesting. Uh, you try to equate that into about 2 million or more, 3 million people. Some people even think that it's more than that, and very possibly could be. Uh, you you uh, uh, can't imagine how big of an area this is. Uh, you, you can see that uh, right in the center, well, that didn't work very well, did it? All right, we'll go, go back and get there and see if I can uh, 
כן. Right in the very center, right there, is the tabernacle. Can you see that, where I drew that circle? Okay, there's the tabernacle. The tabernacle is just a tad bit bigger than this building. That gives you an idea of that. Uh, then it's got the, the eastern gate, which is facing toward the bottom of this picture here. And right out in the front, in this area right there, that's where Moses and Aaron are camped. Then the small camps uh, to the, each side around the tabernacle are the Levites. And uh, they're divided into three camps. And they are the ones that are responsible for the tabernacle. They pack it up. Everyone has their own job. And they haul it. And they carry it to the next place. And they set it up. No one else is permitted to touch it. Uh, it's a, there are very explicit instructions that we have for that. Then you notice that this area down here is Judah. That's the more prominent uh, tribe, the largest of the tribes. They're right to the east, front of the eastern gate. They're kind of the leaders in this ploy. Doesn't always work that way. Dan, your tribe's right over there, see? Okay, right over to the side. And uh, uh, this makes a beautiful picture of the cross. As I stated yesterday, um, the Bible tells us, God tells us through his word, the same story over and over and over and over. A little bit different slant on it every time, but it's a story of man who disobeys God and God who provides a redeemer and salvation and sanctification, glorification, the whole process. So in that, we see that even in the children of Israel in slavery, representing the bondage and the, the slavery to sin, and the Redeemer Moses who comes and delivers them and takes them, and the journey that they're on, the life that they're living, and the ups and downs and the battles and the defeats and the victories that are part of that, and eventually getting to the promised land. And we equate that with our lives. And each of these steps as we read through the Bible, we see how all of this puts together the same sort of teaching about who God is and our relationship to Him. Now, each time you read, you look for the same story. And there'll be little extra tidbits that are added to it, and the story just gets bigger and bigger. Just one story. It's God's love and His relationship for us. Now, yesterday we spent a little bit of time um, uh, talking about the, uh, the story uh, of the snake in the wilderness, them being bitten by snakes. And uh, God told Moses to build uh, a replica uh, of a snake and put it up on a pole and put it out in the camp. And that if you were bitten, then you could go and you could see and you could be healed. Now... We talked about that for a little while yesterday and, and we got off on some, some good ideas about it. And I don't want to spend any time, much time on that today. I just want to re remind you, and I know you've read this this week. There was only one pole. Don't know for sure where it was located. Probably in the tabernacle area, I would suggest. That was the center of the camp. You got this group of people, two million plus, uh, and uh, we equated that yesterday. If you took everybody that lives in Amarillo and Canyon and Happy and Tulia and all the other small towns, Cress and all the way, and Lubbock, Texas Tech University, and all of those people, all of them, camped in one camp together. I mean, jam-packed together you're getting close to how many people there were in this camp. 
Now that's a pretty big camp. And it was infested with snakes. And the scripture says God sent the snakes. Wasn't that they just happened to come into a place that was a bad place. But they had been disobedient to God and they were being disciplined. There was one place that you could go. One pole with a snake on it and you could look at that and you would be healed. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, John, in his gospel, makes reference to this and he equates it, like I said, it's the same story. And he says, just like Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So this is a picture of the cross or the pole or the stake or whatever you want to call that. Different translations say different things. We in our society have really rallied around and set, let the cross be the center of this uh, uh, theological thinking about salvation. It wasn't the cross. It was the one on the cross. Okay? But I want you to get that in your mind, and we're going to come back and kind of put some uh, different thoughts to that in just a minute. As we're reading through the readings for the week, we looked at the Passover, and I wanted to remind you again about Passover. Uh, it, this is in Numbers chapter 9. It says, in the first month of the second year. So they observed the Passover. They had never heard about the Passover before. They were slaves in Egypt. Moses came. God spoke to Moses. Moses said to, Moses said to the people, this is what God wants us to do, okay? So we're to go get a, a lamb, and we're to bring the lamb to the house. We're to keep the lamb. We're to, to offer it as a sacrifice. We're to roast it on a, on a fire. We're to go in our houses, and we're going to close the doors, and we're going to observe the Passover. Well, in preparation for that, as you kill the lamb, you're supposed to take some of the blood and paint it on the doorposts. And the death angel passed over. Now, they were obedient. They didn't understand. I'm sure they didn't know what was really happening. They didn't know it was the beginning of something that we celebrate even till today. Passover. But they were obedient. Now, one year later, God says, I want you to do this again. Okay? In the first month, Moses told them, and he said, this is red letters, God speaking, the Israelites are to observe the Passover at its appointed time. So it has an appointed time. It had an appointed time. That very first Passover was planned. It wasn't just that God came up with at the end of all of these uh, plagues. Well, let's do this. It had an appointed time all the way through history. Just as you and I have an appointed time. Hebrews tells us that it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. So you have an appointment, an appointed time. God has set that. Uh, it's been set from the beginning, the foundation of the world. Passover had an appointed time. And that first one happened when the children of Israel were in Egypt. And then now it's one year later. And they're at Sinai. And God says, Moses, Passover's coming up. It's an appointed time. And I want you to celebrate it, okay? There to us, the, verse 2 says, The Israelites are to observe the Passover at its appointed time. Then he repeats that. You must observe it at its appointed time. Okay? So he's making sure that we get that there's an appointed time. And then he says when it is. It's the 14th day of this month at twilight. You are to observe uh, observe it, the Passover, according to all of its statutes and its ordinances. So, Moses told the Israelites to observe the Passover, and they observed it in the first month on the 14th day at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai. So, how many times here did he say it's an appointed time and when to do it? Over and over, uh, like uh, we don't catch on real easy, right? And how much of the world has said, oh, 
Don't worry about that. Very interesting, isn't it? Okay. Um, Numbers 22 uh, is an interesting uh, part of what we talked about yesterday, and I want to remind you of that, those of you that were not able to be here. Uh, it's about the talking, talking donkey. It's about Balaam, who Balaam was, and uh, how God used a donkey. So if God can use a donkey, he can use me and you and anyone uh, to be uh, a bearer of his message. So Balaam uh, uh, saw these Israelites coming, two million, three million, four million, I don't know how many of them. They're headed across his land, and he doesn't want to lose what he's got. And he sees that they've already destroyed two great kingdoms on their way. Just as they've crossed the Jordan, they entered into battle, and they've had two battles that they've won, and they're headed. Balak is the king, and he's worried about what's going to happen when the Israelites get there. So he goes to Balaam, who is a prophet, and uh, he has the ability to, to uh, curse and evidently has a history of being very successful in presenting or casting curses. And they hire him to come. And you know the story. God speaks to him and tells him, don't, don't curse these people. I have blessed them. And Balaam has his four oracles or poems that he gives. And you need to read those and make sure you look at what he has to say. And he's very careful about that. He's on his way uh, to meet uh, Balak. The, the king, and uh, he's not sure, I believe, exactly what he's going to do, although God's already spoken to him. And the donkey has a problem because the donkey sees the angel in the road, and the donkey heads out across the pasture and goes away. And Balak, uh, or Balaam, uh, beats his donkey and, and gets really rough with his donkey, and then it happens again. And this time it's in a narrow passage, and the donkey put, presses up against the rock wall and crushes his leg and and, uh, and so we've got this battle with the donkey again. Well, Balaam couldn't see the angel. And the donkey did see the angel. And the donkey got away from him. And the third time, the angel caught a very narrow passage that there was no turning to the right or the left and stood with a sword drawn in his hand. And the donkey collapsed in front of him. And Balaam was sitting there. And, uh, but he begins to beat the donkey, and then you have the dialogue that happens, and the donkey begins to speak to him. We talked about talking donkeys yesterday. Read just a couple of verses here. Then, after the donkey talked to him, God opened his eyes. There, there's the end of the story. God brings messages to you and to me, and when we're willing to listen, God opens our eyes. Now, he opened his eyes to spiritual things here, and I believe that he opens our eyes to spiritual things also. And Balaam was able to see the angel that was there, spiritual force in front of him. And it changed his life. Now, we have a lot of questions about Balaam, and there are several places in the Scripture that Balaam is mentioned. And uh, whether Balaam was, there's a debate whether Balaam was uh, a prophet of God or if he was a prophet of Satan or if he was just on his own and he had, was given this gift. And I don't know, you can get into all kinds of debates and there's good sides to both of those. But uh, we do know some facts about it. The fact that uh, when Joshua, uh, the successor of Moses, uh, began to lead the people into the promised land in one of the very first battles that's uh, recorded in Joshua 13 one of the people who they execute and put to death is Balaam so if he was a prophet of God there was some problems there that he had he had uh, turned from God and uh, so he was executed in Joshua 13 we have a couple of places in the New Testament, actually three places where it talks about Balaam. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, it talks about that Balaam had gone astray. And uh, he was the one who loved wages. And uh, it, the, Peter even calls it wages of unrighteousness. So 
uh, that kind of settles a little bit of, uh, of the opinion about what uh, God thinks about how Balaam uh, used that. And in Revelation chapter 2, we have Balaam again. And uh, the, the Spirit is speaking and God's talking and he says, I have a few things against you. And he's talking about these churches there, what the problems were. He says, you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Revelation 2, verse 14. Who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Well, what happened was that Balaam knew that he couldn't curse the Israelites. And so his oracles are kind of teetering on the line of saying, uh, not giving a blessing, but saying that God has blessed them, so I can't curse them. I'm kind of held in limbo. But then, kind of behind everybody's back, he begins to talk to Balak and says, let me tell you, if you want to defeat them, this is the way you would do it. Not that I'm cursing them, okay? But this is the way you'd do that. And he begins to tell them that you bring your beautiful women down there and you tempt them. And you get them to begin to worship other gods. And you just bring in mixture and you just little by little and you'll defeat them. And so that's the reason that God was so upset with Balaam. Because he's the one that instigated the mixture of worship and the changes that, that happened there. And then he was executed at, uh, in Joshua. All right. Enough of that. I folk, I, maybe you've got that in your minds. Uh, this is that, that cycle that they're in. They get punishment and they turn to God. They were slaves. They turn to God, okay? They get on their way. They get mad because they don't have the right thing to eat or the right thing. To, they don't have water, and they gripe, and they complain, and there's some punishment that's there, and they turn back to God. We see this over and over and over. I think it's a picture of my life and of your life, the way we walk it out, okay? And we get on fire for God, and everything is about God. And then we get distracted. And then we get mixtures in there. And then we get something else that gets in the way. And then, and then we wake up one day and we're just miserable again. And we come back to God and the rejoicing that's there. If we could just learn to stay there. That's what this story is about, okay? Now, the next thing that happens right after all of this, when they're really being blessed and doing everything, chapter 25, what we've read this week, says, while Israel was staying in the acacia grove, remember acacia wood was used in building a lot of the, uh, the articles in the tabernacle, the people began to have sexual relations with the women of Moab. This is Balaam's doing. Okay, brings them in. The women invited them to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed in worship to their gods. Now, it didn't happen just one day. It just crept in. And it caught them one by one off guard. And the deterioration of who these people were came to their demise. It began to destroy them from within. So, verse 3, Israel aligned itself with Baal of Peor. Now, uh, we've been taught that the first occurrence of an event or a place or a name or a word in the Scripture is a very important uh, place in, in the Scripture, the Hebrew Scripture. And this is the very first time that Baal. Now, I grew up hearing it and the preacher saying Baal. Now we hear more of Baal, okay? B-A-A-L. It doesn't matter how we pronounce that. That's one of the, the gods that was worshipped. So Israel aligned itself. Now that's a terrible statement, isn't it? Israel aligned themselves with Baal or Baal of Peor. And the Lord's anger burned against them. Now, you can take a few minutes and do a little bit of study about Baal. 
and it's associated with the father God, which is El, E-L, and with his wife Asherah, and you know the Asherah poles that were destroyed, that had to be destroyed, that's part of this, these, this set of deities. Uh, actually, before the Greek mythology, these, are, these were the deities and their names in, in that area. And uh, Baal is, is a part of that. Um, let's just move on. Verse 4. The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord so that his burning anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses told Israel's judges, Kill each of the men who align themselves with Baal. Wow. Now remember a minute ago it said Israel aligned with them. So it's not just a few, there's a lot of folks. And it's going to be mass chaos. It's going to be utter destruction. And God says to do that. Now, something happens and changes that. An Israelite man came bringing a Midianite, wo Midianite woman to his, uh, to his relatives in the sight of Moses and the whole Israelite community while they were weeping at the entrance to the tent of meeting. When... Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, Aaron's grandson, saw this, he got up from the assembly, took a spear in his hand, followed the Israelite man into the tent, and drove it through both the Israelite man and the woman through her belly. Then the plague on the Israelites was stopped. But those who died in the plague numbered 24,000. 24,000 people had already died and the plague had just begun and yet God had mercy again and because one man, the grandson of Aaron, was bold enough and strong enough to take a stand, God said, okay, that's enough. The plague stopped. That's this cycle again goes over and over and over. It's the mercy of God. Um, brings death and destruction. And in our personal lives, you know, the adversary is out to steal, kill, and destroy. Okay? Maybe not exactly in that order every time, but always wanting to steal your identity, who you are so that you don't realize your relationship with God, so that you get so occupied with life that you forget about reading his scripture and you forget about worshiping him and praying and meditating. Those things begin to be sidelines. Now, I've kind of taken a picture here, a picture there, a picture there, here. I kind of like to, to draw that back together, if I may. And I want you to turn your thoughts back to the snake on the pole. Uh, as I was uh, researching some this week, I ran on to an article. <clears throat> it's an article written by a man named Don Matsett. And I don't know him or anything about him. I didn't try to find out anything. I read the article or part of it and it, it intrigued me. And so I, I took some excerpts from his writing and adapted it somewhat to what I think it might fit with us and uh, it, it became uh, enlightening to me and I want to try to pass that on to you and share with you a little bit. I want you to use your imagination with me a little bit now and let's put ourselves back in that camp. Okay? Let's take the modern day church okay, that some would say maybe are caught up in slavery anyway okay and we're going to get freed and we're going to be put into that camp now we got all these different thought patterns uh, let's say denominations or whatever different kinds of groups of people where there are believers and we're all put together and we got all those little camps that you saw a minute ago you know we've got the baptist and the methodist and all the different ones that are around there and we're all in our, in our camp, but we're all one camp, okay? Just use your imagination for a minute. So the snake goes up, 
because there's sin in the camp. People are dying. God's wrath is being poured out. So how do we react? Now, not worried about how the Israelites in that day reacted. I'm talking about how we might react in that situation. Your mind there? You're in the camp, okay? Your neighbors have been bitten, they're dying. Maybe somebody in your family's bitten. Well, we as a society have placed that snake on a pole or what it represents, the cross, in the center of all that we do. So keep that focus and, and hang with me for a minute. Some in one of the camps, or maybe in many of those camps, would have entered into a long philosophical discussion about why these snakes are in the camp. Why these good people have fallen upon bad times. And so they provide seminars for people to come and talk about why bad things have happened to good people and how to remedy that. Some of the sensitive folks felt that it was not a good practice to inform the people of the fiery snakes. It might result uh, in some bad behavior from them. So this would be injurious to their sensitive self-esteem and undoubtedly would inflict irreparable damage on their wounded inner child. Instead of directing people to the snake on the pole, they established support groups for those who had been bitten and had also loved ones as a result of those damnable spirits or serpents. They made the people feel good about themselves in the midst of a bad situation. While others were not against the idea of the snake on a pole, they felt that the real issue was a moral issue, not a snake on a pole. We have these snakes because we've lost our moral sense. We've gone away from God. We've lost our heritage. Rather than focusing on the snake on the pole, they're going to focus on their heritage, who they are, and restoring their family. Some felt that they needed a more conservative leadership that would call the nation back to the pre-wilderness morality because back when they were in slavery they were moral so we just need some good preachers and teachers that would call people back to that pre-morality that we've had in our country in years past we don't need to worry about the snake on the pole others felt the problem was the family namely the men Men were not doing what their spiritual jobs were. They weren't the leaders of their families. So they formed a covenant keepers movement among the men. The men liked this idea because it focused on them, not on the snake on the pole. After all, they reasoned, would a snake dare bite a man of integrity? The more spiritual elders or leaders in the group believed that the real issue was the lack of faith on the part of the people. We need to speak faith into the situation and take authority by binding these fiery serpents. These spiritual folks will not, uh, were not against the idea of a snake on a pole, but it was for the spiritually immature. So if you're immature, you can go to the snake on the pole, but if you're really mature, then you're just going to bind it and cast it out. Identify with different mindsets and different groups and maybe where we've been. A major issue became the inspiration of Moses. Had he really heard from God about this snake on a pole? One group felt that this was merely Moses' opinion. Any healings that had taken place were readily explained by natural causes. A large group of the older elders formed a snake seminar in which they voted on which words God had actually spoken to Moses. So they put together a committee and they had a business meeting and they voted on which of the words were really from God that Moses had spoken to them. Some of the women in the group 
were angered by the fact that Moses, a man, was not sharing the responsibility or lifting up the pole with the women. Okay? One of the women was heard to say, I'm not going to look at any snake on a pole held up by a man. Okay? Shortly afterwards, she died of snake bite. And there was a candlelight vigil held in her honor. The liberals in the camp were opposed by another group who fiercely defended the divine inspiration of Moses, but they felt that Moses was doing an injustice to the whole divine revelation. They wanted to see the tablets of stone, the jar of manna, and Aaron's rod also lifted up on poles. They claimed that Moses was reducing divine revelation to one thing, a snake on a pole. The post-elder, uh, liberal elders, a new group within the camp, felt that their reasoning had advanced beyond the mentality of the liberals and conservatives. They simply smiled at the combatants. People, please, they begged. If a snake on a pole works for some people, why argue? Let them have their snake on a pole. It is their truth, but it should not be imposed upon everyone. Can't we just get along? One group was exceptionally strange. They agreed that the situation was drastic and that Moses had indeed heard from God. But they felt the idea of immediately directing people to a snake on a pole while the snakes were threatening them was bad marketing. We should find out what people are looking for and gradually bring them to the snake on the pole. One expert stated that it might take up to six months of working with seekers before they'd be willing to look at a snake on a pole. So instead, they took a pole to find out what the people wanted. Some wanted aerobics so that they would be able to more effectively run away from the snakes. Others wanted to learn principles of living in the camp where they were snakes on the loose. Others wanted to merely get together and sing some snappy emotional songs and forget about the snakes while they waited for people to be willing to hear about the snake on the pole. They died. And God said, you people need more fiery serpents and he increased the number of fiery serpents until every eye was willing to behold the snake on a pole. Now, long story. Folks, if we don't focus on the snake on the pole, Yeshua dying on the cross, not the emblem, not the picture of the cross, but the fact that God himself died for us. We can get caught up in all kinds of programs, all kinds of ideas, all kinds of ministries, all kinds of things that are really, really good things and miss the most important thing. And that is relationship with God. As this illustration has shown us, as I read that and read it the first time, I, I could just visualize these folks. Now, it's about coming and putting God first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And putting his word as a priority of how we live. That's not easy in today's society. We don't find that many places. Even within groups of people that gather to worship him, it's difficult. As I was working on this, I believe God impressed upon me of just sharing a story that I've not shared uh, in public with this congregation. It's about you and it's something that happened here and I, I've never felt very comfortable of even sharing it but I but I want to share it very quickly with you this morning just to give some illustration of what God does when people are obedient. A number of years ago when this congregation was just really getting started we had some conflict and some problems within the congregation. Uh, it became known that one of the, uh, the uh, ladies in our congregation 
um, who was uh, actually worked in the with the youth and had a leading role in what we did and other things that were here uh, was was uh, living in a, a double life, a life of sin, was having an affair, uh, uh, cheating on her husband. And uh, one of the ladies that was a friend of hers became aware of that. And she asked uh, uh, my wife and some others what she should do. And we began to pray about that and try to figure out what, what should be done. Uh, I'm not trying to tell this story that it anybody could pat themselves on their back, okay? And it's not in, in bragging or in any of that. It's just a, an illustration of what God actually has done. Uh, we decided that we would, we would take the Scripture and that we would actually look in the Scripture and find out what the Scripture said and what we should do. We applied the Scripture the best that we knew how. We uh, applied Matthew 18 where it says that if there's a brother that's done something uh, against you or has aught with you, you're to go with them privately. And so this lady went and spoke with a lady that had the problems and uh, she didn't want to reconcile and she didn't want to change her life and she didn't want to quit teaching our youth and she didn't want to keep quit coming but she wanted the, the double standard. So this lady came back and uh, talked with some other ladies and they took uh, a couple of ladies and sat down and had a meeting with her and sat down and said, you know, what you're doing is wrong and the scripture is very, uh, very clear about that. And, uh, and we want to, uh, to just pray with you and ask you to, to ask God to forgive you and change your life and let us, let us help you. And uh, she said, no, she didn't want to. She liked her lifestyle. And so we followed the process to where it was brought to the church or to the elders. We didn't have elders at that time, but a group that was in charge, deacons and others. And we had a, had a meeting with this lady with her husband present. And we just laid out on the table what actually had happened. And she said yes. And she, didn't ha and she said, that's, uh, that's who I am. And, uh, and just take it or leave it. Said, uh, uh, the, I like my lifestyle. And I'm in an unhappy marriage. And uh, I like uh, sleeping around. And it's just who I am. And uh, so... In counseling over a couple of sessions and, and times that we worked with that, we felt that we had to do what the Scripture said. And so we reverted to God's Word, and we had a meeting with her, and we said, you're no longer welcome here. And we withdraw fellowship from you, and you cannot come back in on our property until God changes your life. And when you ask for forgiveness and your life has changed, you're welcome back. Now, that's part of church discipline. First Corinthians, other places talks about that. I grew up in church. Uh, my dad was a pastor. I've been in the ministry my entire life. I don't ever recall being in church that had that kind of church discipline. Now, let me tell you, the ripples went a long way. The families were tight. It was a small group. It was tough. I didn't know if we would survive that. It was one of the hardest things that I ever did in my whole life was to stand here and explain the situation to our church and say, we have withdrawn fellowship from this lady. And she's not welcome here. And we're going to pray for her, and we're going to pray for her restoration. Well... That was tough. But we began to see God work in a mighty way. And other people came, and the fellowship began to grow, and the people began to mature, and they began to realize that when you put the snake on the pole, God's word, God's son, his sacrifice first, and not the things of the world or the way we want to do that or what kind of things would be politically correct, then God's power moves in. And God begins to bless and strengthen. Now, 
That event's not forgotten. But God has blessed us through that. And we are much better people and much stronger of a congregation because we went to the pole, the snake on the pole. We didn't do what we thought would be best. We did what God thought would be best. Now, I want to bring that around. I just, I, I just, some of you that are new, you need to know where we are, where we've come from. We've made a lot of mistakes getting here. Okay? We're probably going to make some more mistakes. I, I could say that stronger. I'm sure we're going to make some more mistakes. But God needs to be the center. And when we put Him in the center of the camp, and when we elevate this Messiah and let Him be the one that's in charge, and we follow His principles and His guidelines, it'll change our lives. It'll make us stronger. It'll make us see things that we haven't seen before. You see, Balaam's eyes were opened. God opened his eyes because he needed to see. Well, our eyes are being opened. And we need to see what's coming. God is at work in this world. We are on a fast pace in times. Let's keep Yeshua in the center of the camp. Let's don't go our own ways. Now bring that down to personal life. There's a lot of things that we can do that are good things. And just being a good person, that's marvelous. It's wonderful. But if you don't have Yeshua, Jesus, the Father, in the center of your camp, that everything revolves around that. We don't make decisions without consulting our Father. We don't do things on our own. Now, when that happens... Life changes. That doesn't mean that life's going to be perfect and beautiful and no bumps in the road. Wasn't for the children of Israel. Never has been. But when you get down the road and you look back, you realize, praise God that I'm on this path and not that one over there. You may not see it momentarily. But as you get down the road and you look back, Tell you, I, I hesitated and I, I, I even came almost with the same thought pattern that, that the Messiah did in the garden when he said, if there is any way, <laughs> let's don't do this. But there wasn't another way. And this congregation was obedient to God. And I believe that that's the reason that many of you are here today is because God recognized that there was a congregation here that their desire is to put him in the middle of the camp. And when we put him in the middle of the camp, other people who are putting Messiah in the center of their camp will align. And over a period of time, lots of folks are going to come. And they're the ones who are going to be strong. Strong in their faith. And I praise God that I'm a part of this family. And I covet your prayers in leadership and what we're doing. And I ask that you personally keep Messiah in the center of your camp. And that you hold us as leaders accountable that we preach Jesus crucified. That we come always to put him in the center of our camp. 
that we don't get sidetracked, that we're not like the Israelites right after all this great thing that happened and Balaam tells Balak to go and seduce them. And there they were, fallen again. We've got to be on our guards because the world is out for us. The adversary is out to steal your joy, to steal your identity, to steal your witness, to destroy you, and eventually kill you. And the only way to survive is to look at the snake on the pole. To look to the Messiah. To accept his salvation. There's not any other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's talking about his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. Being lifted up high and exalted. Keep our focus on the center of the camp, Messiah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for what you've done and for how you teach us. And for through the years, the way you've brought us to this point today. Father, we praise you. We say hallelujah. We just humble ourselves before you and realize that you are God. And that we are frail and weak. And that we must turn and see you elevated high. Lifted up in the camp. Father, I just ask that you pour out your blessings upon this group. Lord, that you touch their lives. Lord, that you set our feet on solid rock. Lord, that you take us in paths of righteousness. That we may glorify your name that we may be the people that you've called us to be, that we may be the light in this community. But Father, don't get us distracted by wanting to be light because you are the light. Help us to be reminded that in the center of our camp has to be lifted up on a pole, the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you, Father, that you loved us enough that you sent your only begotten Son, that while we were yet sinners and didn't love you, that you died for us. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you for salvation. Now, restore our joy. Bring us to a point of rejoicing in realizing that you stand in the midst of our camp. Help us to focus our eyes on you and not be distracted by the world. Give us a week that we may rejoice and praise you and spend time in your word. Meditate on what you teach us and share that with those that are around us. That your love may be extended to the farthest reaches of this world. In the name of our Messiah, we pray rejoicing and say amen have a blessed day enjoy your afternoon with the family god bless you for being here